She's won the Arjun Award from the government, and she's right. <laughs> Because the, the magic of uh, a public speaking course works by the actual time and the sessions that you do. People say, well, you teach the subject, you teach it your armor, give me some, some tips. And it's, it's not that much about tips as it is for everyone to come up on stage and go through the exercise and get feedback from, from smart community. That being said, I think there's a few nuggets that we can go through on what this class has been about. It's something that I have done seven times in the last two years, and it's, it's also represents in my time of my work in television and consulting that we brought to this. The second part, and I think it might be even more practical for you, is to introduce you to new forms of, and more engaging forms of pedagogy and teaching. Uh, there is a sense that teaching can be enjoyed can be enjoyable for the faculty, and teaching can be enjoyable for the student. It can also be more engaging at a different level of engagement than it traditionally is. Now, I'm sure most of you think about this on a day-to-day -day basis and have your own best practices on how to make teaching more engaging. But let me actually just, through visuals and through a conversation, an interactive conversation, share with you how this is done at one of the institutions that I know, and that has been known for teaching. Okay, so that would be the second part. I would encourage you to, to make this interactive, so if you have questions, please, you know, please feel free to, to voice your opinions. We're hoping that this is a culture that we can get across throughout most of the schools where you empower the students to be, that it's okay to respectfully ask questions. There is a sense in teaching that you know there's one side gives information, the other side receives it. And there's a part of our culture that I think it's important to retain. Right, that, that will always be there. But at the same time, I think we can push the boundaries a little bit in terms of empowering students, people in the audience to engage a little more actively. Yeah. Sure. Okay. okay, so whenever I do a session on public speaking and the first day of class when students take a public speaking course, they invariably like this. <laughs> To some extent, right now, you know, what is the session going to be about? What is going to be about this? Why are we taking an hour and a half? Am I going to be asked to come up on stage and do something? But fortunately, through a process that we go through, the last day looks like this. This is actually the first group that I work with. I, as Rindal said, I teach at the Fletcher School of International Law and Diplomacy. It was a joint Harvard House initiative to train students on, uh, on international affairs. 
There is a very rich diversity of, of nationalities of students there, and there's a feeling that at the end of the class, right, for my course and for many others, you feel you've really gotten to know the students. I think a couple of classes down, you feel you know all their names, you know a little bit of their backgrounds. Again, in medicine, you know, it's, it's a bit harder because there's a lot of there's a lot of data to get, right? A lot of knowledge to impart, and less of listening to students' speeches. But I still feel we can kind of push that out. Also, I must say, for this audience, uh, I have been uh, a dentistry, okay? And unfortunately, uh, my, the budget has been a nightmare for me living in the US because I had four root canals and uh, about 10, you know, 15, 12 fillings. So I've got some silver fillings, I've got some very right, newer fillings. We've done uh, some gum scaling. Um, yeah, it's just a whole bunch of things. So I don't know the reason. Perhaps I wasn't into flossing earlier. But uh, now I'm going to try and floss regularly to help make some things a little bit of a smile. If some of your faces do. Okay. This is actually the last group that I worked with. Now, out of the 30 odd students, uh, they're the out of 21 different uh, countries. And I think this is an important benchmark for us. The Indian School of Business was also instituted about six years ago, an international school. But one of the challenges that they've had is attracting international students. Now, this is a school of international relations, so you, so you get that. But as we aspire to be a world class institution here, a good benchmark is are we able to attract international students in here? It might be something down the line, four or five years down the line, but something to think about. And then along the way, there have been a whole bunch of other uh, experiences here, but I feel you know one of the things that I've aspired to, and I think to some extent the course has given that, uh, that capability, is for each group, every time I look at this group right at the end of the class, I know their names, I know something about their backgrounds, I know what they contributed in class. And in terms of grading, there is an interesting paradigm shift in that at Harvard Business School, 50% of your class grade, 50% of your class grade is based on participation. Okay, the Fletcher School is about 30 This is a foreign concept. What does that mean? And how is that even feasible when at, in medical school and dental school, like a percentage or a mark here and there leads to you know, people asking very objective questions? What does it mean to provide 30% of your entire grade based on participation? What is participation? At the business school level, participation is you're raising your hand and making a point related to a subject. So you get a case study. You read the case, and then the professor says, you know, Arun, you know, you're the protagonist, and what would you, how would you start us off thinking about the case? So you make your points. Someone else will listen to what you have said, and then make a side point or give some statistics. Typically, in a 90-person class, you might be able to speak once in 1975 minutes. But what you say has to be so sharp, and the instructor speaking is only about 30% of the time. Now, I'm not saying that these models from a different school need to be applied to a new context. But there are, I think, some, some food for thought there in terms of how can you flip the classroom around? How can you flip it around so that the students feel like they're, to some extent, they're on the spot, a little bit of nervousness, a little bit of cold calling is almost healthy. Interestingly, the feedback that I get in the, the written portion of my classes is students say that Cold calling, you know, we're so we so dreaded at the beginning, but it was one of the most effective ways to keep us engaged. When someone's made a speech and said, said a few things, like this is impromptu speech, two minutes later I will go back and cold call and ask the person to summarize what this person had said. If there was a statistic that was given earlier, you can still come back and in a nice way say, you know, thanks. Can you can you Explain me own words, you know, this theory that we had just done 15 minutes ago. If you try it, you'll see how initially there'll be stress, but even that process of communicating in real time is very beneficial to the students. When you try this, uh, you, you do a kind of a little bit of an interactive, kind of re-summarize for me what, what we had just said, or say it in your own words, how you understand this concept. Maybe if you try this a little bit. Yes, please. What is your name? Uh, I'm from the School of Hospitality, Tourism Studies, and in Agar, Asmita. Uh, in our syllabus, there are no uh, 
scientific definitions to hospitality. You know what I mean? So wherever we explain a concept, I always insist the students now write down something about hospitality in your own words. What do you do to make a person feel comfortable? Or what do you do to make a person feel important? That is something hospitality. So explain it in your own words. That's I see. So you have an interactive exercise yeah. where the student will say the so ways to I think one of the things that we uh, we have to think about is also language. So one of the I guess the benefits in the U.S. is everyone speaks English and there's a certain level of proficiency. So for a lot of smart, creative people, if, if English is a barrier and that's the mode of instruction, there is a little more of guidance, patience, and uh, you know encouragement that is required for them to feel open. And I think it's okay, I mean, if, if Hindi or Bharati, I mean, I think it's okay to express, ask them to express themselves in that language. But I feel these days it's, it's a matter of pride, you know, you, you explain it, you get it. And then as an instructor, if it's done in Hindi, you can translate it. Or you can, you can just have these sessions outside where you basically encourage people to speak up. Then, then, it's, then it's a more engaging and a fun environment. Now this led also this the Indian Foreign Service. So fortunately, you know, I got on this path and I was teaching there. This group came along, actually a more senior group at the school. And they felt that this is universally applicable for what we were going through. And they, you know, I was invited to speak at the Indian Foreign Service, not the Indian Administrative Service too. You know, it's one of those things I look forward to having a short session, but to spur, kind of spur a seed of motivation to think about my area of public speaking. But it can be about your area. My sense is, you know, I've, I've had this opportunity of just focusing on one area. And I've done this with single-minded dedication after a while. And if whatever area you pick, if you focus on just teaching, unlike many of you, I did not have the burden of also doing research. So that, that freed me up. I was a pure lecturer. I said, you focus on compelling teaching, and you do it as well as you can. By that focus, you realize that after time, the world opens up. And whatever your field is, people want to listen to you and they want to engage with you as long as you've been truly engaging with your own work. Also, I think you mentioned hospitality. I was under the impression that it's maybe dentists. May, may I ask who's the dentist? Most of them. Yes, we are. We are okay, who is not from the dental faculty? Just yourself, as well. We are entire team was hospitality. Okay, well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. So this is again the agenda that I talked about. Let me go through some of the public speaking parts now. Uh, our, our course is called communication, but it focuses on public speaking, just because we feel it takes time to move the needle in a specific area. If we have writing and speaking, and there's all different areas of speaking, we won't get to answer on something in a half semester or full semester. Also on that, on that point, uh, moving gra graphics and GIFs aren't best practice in human presentation. But at the Fletcher School, we have a certain culture where all parts of life are explained on this internal website. So the hangover I felt after the party or how I feel before exams is done through a movie gift. So this is something that I've used to them. But a couple of illustrations to this in class, and pardon me if I, I mean, I don't think I'll need to do this here, but it's so easy, as you probably know, to tell from this side who's not listening and who's not engaged. You know? and, and what I try to do in a healthy way is not to expose them, but to get them involved. So then I'll look at them, and then they'll know that there's a question coming to them. But this, this won't work. In the US, a typical course for which students are paying, on average, eight to $10,000 for tuition has only three hours of instruction time. Only three hours. So you are paying a lot of money to be there. And those three hours, you better be engaged. It's not like I have to go to college all day and then sort of blast out of that and take a day. You're there, and like there's a, there's a buzz and an energy when you come into the class. Feedback, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the important thing listening. Communication is so much about listening. And listening is a muscle that definitely can be exercised. If you put people in a simulated, in a natural environment, in a simulated environment, which is public speaking, and where there are real risk and rewards. If I was to ask someone to summarize something, and they will feel bad if they are not able to answer correctly, right? So that that alertness will stimulate your listening and memory muscles, and it can be done in the classroom. 
that's, you know, as I just said, sometimes just the fear of, of being cold called will allow you to prepare with more diligence and have a point of view. And there can be group exercises too for public speaking as well as groups that are set up to discuss concepts. You can bring them out on stage, give them an opportunity to come out here in the middle of class and, and almost problem solve as a group debate as a group. Now, my course is called The Arts of Communication. It's called The Arts of Communication. Because in public speaking, in a public speaking mechanic, I'll come here and tell me about public speaking. But there are so many spheres of speaking. So the art of ceremonial speaking, right, those tributes and eulogies, when you give a eulogy to someone, is so different from the art of impromptu speaking, which is different from the art of debating, which is different from the art of elevator pitching. Do you know what elevator pitching is? It's a very common, common term in the US. What is elevator pitching? Make a guess. I would hate the cold call from a list of faculty. <laughs> this, is, this is a real honor and a dubious honor to actually ask. Yes. What is your best guess? What is elevator pitching? Yes, yes please. What is your name? Okay. And it's a very, very good guess. Unfortunately, that's not the right answer. Okay. It's a very good guess. Speaking to a stranger. Rinder wants to guess. Okay. What is your percentage of confidence in your answer? Yeah, elevator pitch. Yeah. 95. 95. Wow, 95. Okay. So, as far as I understand, elevator pitch is uh, the time you get with a person in the lift is uh, Synergy and in that 30 seconds or 20 seconds, you've got to sell your idea to that person. So that time in the elevator is the only time you have to pitch for it. We think about his confidence that. <laughs> now, what do you think about his confidence that? Do you disagree? Sounds good. Sounds good? <laughs> Sounds good? How many, of, how many of you agree with Rinda? Put your money on what this is the definition of elevator. <laughs> you have to agree what? You have to agree or not agree? Okay. Okay. okay, so look, the senior bench a high correlation here, right? You have to change your, your mind based on the probability that the first bench is really... Okay, can I just see enthusiastically how many arms are up? Okay, and now? The other side, you have to vote once. Okay, can I see how many of you disagree with Rinda? I will ask my mother what is her opinion, agree or disagree? Yeah. I am an observer today. <laughs> okay. So I'd say you have about 55% uh, approval, about 45% disapproval. You have one more chance. You will take your one more salary on the line. <laughs> will you go with it? Will you defer to someone else? Or to someone else? I go with it. And it's time for the right answer. And Rundan was completely accurate. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> That's the other thing. You know, I carry a, a, a power bar with me in all the classes, and I give a, a bar at the end of the day to the most enthusiastic class participant. So the person who has applauded, just kind of looks engaged, who's most energized. So I, I, I think we will have that too. We may have a more like an Indian suite to give. But keep that in mind. I'll, I'll keep a domination. And, Mention it. Uh, okay. So remember that is exactly right. If you had 30 seconds to go up in an elevator, or whatever time, 45 seconds or so, and you are going to pitch an important idea, typically this applies to entrepreneurs, where you've written a 100-page business plan. If you want to get funding for something, you better write in the paper. But those 100 pages need to be summarized in 35, 40 seconds. The same thing that you would take a four hour meeting for, you should be able to say it in 40 seconds. This is an amazing skill. What do you choose to say, and more importantly, what do you choose to not say? That is elevator pitching, and it's so important because decision makers for important things in your life will have very little time. They're also used to a different set of language. So you need to, to convert the technical jargon or the details into a bottom line and a visual message. And that by itself, it at least takes a week in a curriculum. 
So that's why we go through all these different scenarios. And we provide speeches will be then the case studies, and then we discuss them, and then we make the students do it. In your own fields, with hospitality, dental, medical, it may not apply to most parts of the curriculum, but it, I promise you, can apply to 20, 30 percent of the curriculum. Can you think out of the box and make it engaging? You know, I promise you, it's more fun on this side also. It's as opposed to let me get this done. You want to move in your public speaking to let me enjoy this process. And I think the same thing can be done for you. Now let me give you a, a trivia, another trivia question. I think this works. People say, oh, I know, you know, public speaking, I've been good at debating, I've done it all my life. Let me ask you another question. Please think about this. If, if say next week there is a TEDx event here, and you've been selected to give a five minute speech. Five minutes. Clock will cut off. Get there, they're pretty straight. Ranges from eight minutes to eighteen minutes. Let's say you have five minutes to give a speech here. And if you go back to your computer and start writing, not necessarily you won't necessarily read from the script, but if you were to record you and guess how many words you've spoken in five minutes. How many words should you write for a five minute speech? This is basic, right? You need to know how to fill the time. And let me let me guess. Uh, let me ask you for guesses. How many words? So what is your name? So, what is your best bet? You've been picked for a TED talk next week. You have five minutes, three hundred seconds. How many words will you get? Okay. What is the rationale for that? They had an eight minute presentation and you spoke this proportionally longer and longer. So 800 words would be about 2.7, 2.8 words a second. So that's our first guess. What is, a, what is another guess? In the purple? Yes. What is your I would like to what show more. What is your name? Vaibhav. Huh? Vaibhav. I would like to show more of our pictures rather than our words. Okay, so I'm asking you theory, right? clearly if there is if there's pauses, if there's any theatrical element, if you're showing a video. Yeah. It's, it's not, I'm just asking you, what is the speed of human speech? The speed of human speech? Yeah, so if you were to talk in a podium in a normal manner, how many words will you speak? I don't think so, more than four, five hundred words. Four, five hundred, okay. Five minutes, four, five hundred, here we have eight hundred. We have a 2x difference. You will write 4 to 500 words, you will write 800 words. What are some other guesses? The technical thing is that in one minute you should show one slide. So in 10 minutes you should show 10 slides to be with the audience. Okay. But that's a separate, again, that's. Oh, I would say 250 words. 250 words. Okay, but I'm just, okay, let's put the slides. The slides will play. If you were just speaking, if there was just a speaking, which you do in 10, stuff, stuff, you know, plays behind you. If you were speaking continuously for five minutes, you'd say how many words? <laughs> five hundred. Five hundred words. Any other guesses? Higher or lower? Eighteen hundred. The right answer was given by Mr. Gokul. Oh. I think you will do a little better, right? Over time. So the speed of speech is 2.5 to 3 words a second. It is not one, it is not four. I can guarantee you that. I can guarantee you. Across languages, across cultures, research has been done. It is actually narrower than a standard uh, distribution. And just you know, think about this. How many words have I just spoken in how many seconds? Or how many words have I spoken in how many seconds? It is critical to know if you have five minutes, 300 seconds, 
you will, will be somewhere around 800, 2.5 to 3. If you write 400, I promise you, you'll finish before time. If you write 1,800, it'll be fun to watch you. <laughs> so that's, that's just one. You know, if you sit through the class in every course, right? It puts me to most of many courses. At the end, they say, I took like 10 courses, and they remember just a few things. That's how memory works. And I've seen students in my class, there'll be a lot of exercises, but there'll be a few things I want you to remember. But I want you to remember for life. And that's, I feel, the mission as, as teachers that we should have. To think about the most compelling way to deliver it. To give them a little bit, but strong nuggets that we remember. So if we had, uh, say, if you had 10 minutes, how many words would you speak? Maybe on the spot a little bit. So, 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 so 10 minutes you read 600 seconds, right? So 600 seconds you read about 300 words or something. Excellent. So that's my key. actually make them my models and I can see where I put my opinion. So yeah, this is this is one of those lines. 2.5 to 3 words a second. Now I'll go through some of this quickly because I want to keep time also, but if I was to ask you, if I was to have another exercise like this, what makes a great speaker? People will have different points, you know, leadership IQ, audience, understanding the audience. If you have a list like this, what happens is when you come to the home, you probably won't remember anything. So, you know, I gotta check this, I gotta check that. So from uh, ancient Greek days, Till today, in course on persuasion, negotiation, communication, there are three things that we ask you to think about. And this is how this is the framework that we use to grade speeches. So typically a student will come and give a four-minute speech, three students will give verbal feedback, half the student will write feedback, then the teaching assistant will give feedback, then I'll give feedback. But to make it easier rather than just going off, well, you didn't understand the audience and this, that, we will try to go around three lines. Logos, ethos, and values. Logos is the content of the speech. Pathos has to do with the connect, emotional connect. It doesn't mean you need to be emotional. It needs to be how you connect on a personal level. If you talk, you speak in a dry manner, you will not connect. But what is ethos? What is ethos? If logos is the content, it's Maybe connect your actions. Content is logos. Yes, why is So that comes through your pathos. It's all part of pathos. Ethos is something that people often think about the word. Who feels they have a 90% plus? Uh, yes, right here. Ethos, so important. I think you're going through a great laundry list. <laughs> the probability of you getting right at some point of the days is pretty high. Uh, okay, so ethos has to do with the credibility. Now, this is something that people don't think about enough. The credibility that you will have based on an introduction or based on your background will be will only last so long. And there are actual times in the speech where you have to make statements that reaffirm why you're the right person to say it. It comes across really subtly in speech when you watch a speech right now. And I'll ask you to think about this. I'll ask you to go through the speech from the lens of logos, ethos, and methods. And I'll show you what it looks By the way, you don't need to take notes also. I will, this presentation, I'll be sending you a PDF format. So you have everyone who attends. I just ask you to keep it within the group because it's not a presentation to be circulated without uh, you know, kind of being there. So ethos, logos, and pathos is three things to think of as we start on this journey of public speaking. Now here's Justin Timberlake, right? And after breaking this down, here's, a, here's an overall philosophy. And let me give a quick share of it. Sachin Tendulkar comes to back. He's been, you're actually, by the way, we're the same age. In case you're wondering how old I am, I have entered my 40s. So I'll take whatever credibility that, that I get with that. Such a good Dukkar and I were born in the same year, actually a month within each other. And uh, when he comes into BAC, right, we, uh, there are two approaches. He can say, till 
till the very end. Let me make sure I practice as much as possible. Let me focus. Let me make sure I remember how, what I need to do. Let me think about how I played against Melvin God. Everything, let me just get it all in. Let me be focused. Right? I need to do well. Roger Federer can say the same thing. Get all the practice I can. Be focused. The other approach is I've been doing this for 20 years. If I'm on a stage, whether it's a public speaking or a sport, it is because of something that I have committed to and that's something that's a big part of who I am. And I can completely relax and get as close to the 100% of my poten relaxed potential. That's the approach that I've taken for the students or people of executive training that I do. That it's going to be very hard to go over that 100% potential. But when you come on stage, try to move away from the classic philosophy that most high achievers have. I want to get this done well. But in public speaking, there's usually stakes on the line. I want to make sure you get through that script. I need to get this done well. You need to move from that to, I want to enjoy this process. All good public speakers go on a trajectory where they start enjoying a larger portion of being here. It's very hard. People who choose to take my course, even at these universities, have issues with public speaking. They, they get nervous. The, the crowd does something with their eyes on them. You know, it brings out, so your body does things that it doesn't do when, when it's in normal capacity, right? But if you can, it won't happen overnight, if you can go from enjoying one minute of a four minute speech to a minute and a half, minute 45 seconds, I think that's the, the part that you People say, what should you do with your arms? Uh, again, we can do this interactively, but the short, much short answer is let them hang naturally. This is not better than this. However, your arms, your body gives you power. It's very much about understanding individual power and speaking. So my class is not so much about keep posture a certain way, keep your arms a certain way. This is very individual. You have to see how it works for the individual and you give them custom on speaker. I would also suggest that you think about this in terms of personalized learning. The students learn in different ways, and as a faculty member, it's, it's, it's your, I feel it's our duty to, to think about the best way is to engage a certain set of students or a certain group of students. And they may not be the same from semester to semester. Finally, if you were, I think many of you were there at uh, the function for the vice chancellor, the vice chancellor that we had two weeks ago. And I was so impressed, I was just, you know, I was listening with so much awe to Dr. Snevata, I was like, what a lovely orator, you know, Marathi, and then she spoke in English. And then I thought I was reading, but she said, you know, Professor Mankat says this, uh, you know, somehow she, at her age, had gone to YouTube and seen one of my videos, in which I say, when you're on stage, while everyone tells you, okay, sorry, I'm going to distract you with this, but everyone tells you to make eye contact with everyone, one of the exercises that we do in class is when you go on stage, when like you're on stage with a mic, you spend 10 seconds before you speak, you know, making eye, making eye contact. That demystifies the audience, makes the enemy friendly. You can find those friendly faces. A few faces will be supporting you already. And so now, if you were to come directly, I've done this with executives, and there was a bank, uh, central bank head from Indonesia. The next day, in our presence, he went and he was like literally staring people down. The judges were a little clearer. So you don't need to apply that uh, obviously to my senses when you're on a presentation as opposed to just opening and starting to speak. When you come out here, as you're naturally doing this, don't, don't be shy. Right? Make yourself, so some of that nervousness dissipates before you start speaking. It happens in your classes with it. No matter how many times you've done it, you will be nervous. And as opposed to saying, students are now, this is the agenda. Just have those, let those moments live. Where you look up. So I have a question. Uh, there are many times we face students who are disinterested in the class and they go like that and they will start putting the pen in the mouth and they are not ready to listen. How do we try to keep them engaged all the time? Because that is distracting for us as a teacher. Yeah, the is Sorry? What's your name? Asmita. Asmita, this is actually, I mean, I can give perspective, but I think there's a lot more depth of perspective here, but the question that you asked in terms of strategies for engagement deserves another session like this that you can 
facility. Because there are all kinds of practices, all kinds of things people have tried. And this, I hope this is just one of many workshops that you can have as a group because you need to share this you know, between each other. I mean, I feel for time, we won't go into this because uh, yeah, we'll get a couple of perspectives that engaging students by itself is something that needs a richer time discussion. Okay. And finally, keep in mind that the audience does not bring the intensity that you think it has. Because there's a beautiful, uh, actually I'm going to share this, a beautiful chapter of a uh, Ronald Reagan speechwriter, which uh, this chapter on audience and intensity. But if you research, it's found that the speaker's perception of how judgmental and how harsh the audience is, is a grave difference from reality of what the audience is expecting. Most of the audience is happy to just have someone make any sense here. And then, on top of that, when you are able to engage them, there's a higher, there's a much higher likeness disproportionately and respect that they have for you. When you are vulnerable, in your mind, there's a sense, oh my god, I just stammered, or I forgot my point, and I wanted to say this earlier. But the audience relates to you if you're able to pick yourself up. Same thing on television. You know, I'm great too. This is what I face. You know, make a mistake on camera. Everything's live. You know, when the Olympics are going on, there are 11,000 athletes creating the events, 30, 35 sports, and they're all happening live. And you will inevitably make mistakes, right? But the world is quite forgiving if, if you feel you're pretty sincere. So enough of these tips right now, only the one last one and we'll get into our speech. One last one. Sound bites. What is a sound bite? It's not voice modulation. Now you can see the momentum, you hear it once and everyone feels that's the right answer. No. Is it summary? Or summary? Say more please. Summary. Okay. Or one, one line which, uh, which gives the uh, you know, gist of your speech. Excellent. Excellent. How about a collective round of applause for this? <laughs> Thank you. So the sound bite is important. It is required in the spoken word in speech. It is not required in writing. It actually came from the radio days and then it was later in television. What happens even if you have two minutes only? with the Prime Minister. And then you need to get this perspective on something. In two minutes, he will speak how many words? 360 or so, if you get two minutes. What's still going to make it on television will be a couple of lines that need to be self-contained lines that will still carry the gist of what we see. A good speaker will have many sound bites. It summarizes what you have just said before in a sentence or a set of words that can be cut separately and remember a lot of a good sound bite is what after the speech you will be able to do. Let's watch our first speech. Now the first speech I want to ask you to is just three minutes, 180 seconds. It is also not from a conventional leader, like you know, the look at him such a great speaker and very worthy. This is a 19-year-old student like you have in many of your classes. Comes into a court of law in the US, in the state of Iowa, and he's one of a dozen people testifying on the issue of same sex marriage. It's a controversial issue everywhere in the world. You know, there is, uh, he's raised by two women. Now, interestingly, he's, you can see his nervousness. You can, you can connect with him earlier. And then I want you to think about how in three minutes he's able to create an impact. He's saying, well, do I need time to create an impact? Do I need to be smooth to have an impact? We're going to see how this works. I want you to think about Logos Ethos Pathos, and even more importantly, which I may go call you on, is I want you to think about sound bites. So if you hear sound bites, write them down and think about them in these three things. Okay. So let me play this. Okay. My name is Zach Walls, I'm a sixth generation Iowan and an engineering student at the University of Iowa, and I was raised by two women. Uh, my biological mom, Terry, told her grandparents that she was pregnant, that the artificial insemination had worked, and they wouldn't even acknowledge it. 
It actually wasn't until I was born and they succumbed to my infantile cuteness that they broke down and told me that they were thrilled to have another grandson. Unfortunately, neither of them lived to see her marry her partner Jackie of 15 years when they wed in 2009. My younger sister and only sibling was born in 1994. We actually have the same anonymous donors, so we're full siblings, which is really cool for me. Uh, you know, and I guess the point is that our family really isn't so different from any other Iowa family. You know, when I'm home, we go to church together, we eat dinner, we go on vacations. Uh, but, you know, we have our hard times too, we get in fights. Actually, my mom, Perry, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2000. It is a devastating disease that put her in a wheelchair, so we've had our struggles. But, you know, we're islands. We don't expect anyone to solve our problems for us. We'll fight our own battles. We just hope for equal and fair treatment from our government. Being a student at the University of Iowa, the topic of same-sex marriage comes up quite frequently in classroom discussions. You know, and the question always comes down to, well, gays even raise kids. And the question, you know, the conversation gets quiet for a moment because most people don't really have an answer. And then I raise my hand and say, actually, I was raised by a gay couple and I'm doing pretty well. I scored in the 99th percentile on the ACT. I'm actually an Eagle Scout. I own and operate my own small business. If I was your son, Mr. Chairman, I believe I'd make you very proud. I'm not really so different from any of your children. My family really isn't so different from yours. After all, your family doesn't derive its sense of worth from being told by the state, you're married, congratulations. No, the sense of family comes from the commitment we make to each other. To work through the hard times so we can enjoy the good ones. It comes from the love that binds us. That's what makes a family. So what you're voting here isn't to change us. It's not to change our families, it's to change how the law views us, how the law treats us. You are voting for the first time in the history of our state to codify discrimination into our Constitution. A Constitution that but for the proposed amendment is the least amended Constitution in the United States of America. You are telling Iowans that some among you are second-class citizens who do not have the right to marry the person you love. So will this vote affect my family? Will it affect yours? Over the next two hours, I'm sure we're going to hear plenty of testimony about how damaging having gay parents is on kids. But in my 19 years, not once have I ever been confronted by an individual who realized independently that I was raised by a gay couple. And you know why? Because the sexual orientation of my parents has had zero effect on the content of my character. Thank you very much. Mike, to here. So start to finish three minutes. The first minute is very different from the second minute. It's very different from the third minute. In the first minute, there's a lot of, well, um, you know, there's, there's nervousness, right? This person's coming in court of law. There's the judges in front of him, there's a chairman. And then you see the crescendo as, as it continues. But let me start with just the sound bites. What were the sound bites in this speech for you? First was that my family is no different from your family, or any other family. There's a concept of family, and this was a statement. Yeah, right? that was a statement. My family is no different from yours. Absolutely. That's what he says. Yeah. Other sound bites. In the corner there. Uh, what was your name? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm going to challenge you, what, sometimes I'll stay with you until the, the question, specific question, you know, is addressed. Okay, so the question was, what was the, what is a sound bite that stood out for you? As I've explained, a sound bite is a self-contained sentence or phrase that you remember as it was said, right, and that captures a part of the speech. So what was that sound bite? I different than any other person. Okay. I think the last sound bite that he came out said that in 19 years on wild breaking, Sexual orientation. Yeah, sexual orientation. So it was a very powerful message. And just on that, like, what tells, is there another sound bite? There are about eight or ten that stand out. What would be another sound bite? One second. So this is, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate also. I'm trying to illustrate. I'm trying to illustrate the interaction of like, you know, what happens is when there's class participation, people will know the answers. But then you focus on one person to make sure that they're engaged. So 
But you know the way it's worked over there is you kind of so the, there's a sense of order where you know if you're coming to one person, then you pay we go back. So okay, I'll just finish and I'll come right to you. Yeah. So for now, any other outside? So a little bit on the spot, but I, I think it'd be helpful for us to go through. Any other sound bite in the speech? Okay, let's think how did we start? What did he say at the beginning? The first minute, how did we introduce himself? Okay. How about in the towards the end of the second minute, where he points to the, the chairman, he says something. Now hold back. You have to hold back, okay? There's a sense you want to share. Hold back. He asked about his son. Okay. He asked the chairman about his son. What did he say? What? What else? What else? Stay with me just now. What else in the third minute? Something I'm sure that will come through. What did he say? How did he end his speech? <coughs> I'll come back in a little bit. We'll have a discussion. What did he say about the chair? Yeah, this is a very important, a very unusual statement for a student to make in the fourth It's a cultural tsunami. When you're doing your speeches, right, this is not something that you start immediately writing. I ask students when you're speaking in front of an audience for four minutes, any smart person can go back if it's something that they're excited about and come back in two hours and put together something. But I say for a four minute speech, you need 10 hours, like 10 of your hours for everything. Scripting earlier, bullet points, thinking, practicing with people. 10 hours. Statements like this come in hours 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Putting together this script. At some point, I want to say these three things that I've done. But wait, can I say, can I address the chairman itself and say, if I was your son, Mr. Chairman, I believe I would make you proud. That statement also needs to come at a certain point in a speech. If it comes too early, then there's a sense, who's this kid? What is this about? What did he say specifically before this? He made three points. I'm going to come to you for three points. So who has one point that he had made? Say, sir? So my name is Kishore. He said, how the law treats us. No, no, no. Right before this, again, I'm going to stick. Right before he said, if I was your son, Mr. Chairman, I believe I would make you proud. He gave three facts about his life. One second, I know it's so tempting. It's so tempting. You want to say, pull back to come to you. Okay. He said three things. This is how you engage one, one person, because it's there, right? Remember he said something about his life? Uh, that Something he said, like, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I believe I would make you proud. Something about business. Okay, one of the things. Okay, that's fine. One of the things he had said. Okay. Right? He said three things. One of the things he said is I started my own business. Okay. The other thing he said, something about a score, right? Do you remember? See now how much you remember, right? And I scored on the 99th percentile of my ACT, which happens to be a test in the US. And he said the third thing. He's an Eagle Scout. Yes, wonderful. Okay. This was this two minutes of his speech, two minutes, 20 seconds later is when he reaches his climax, his crescendo. He said, I've been an Eagle Scout, I've started my own business, and I scored 99 percentile in the ACT. Then he says, if I was your son, Mr. Chairman, I think he I mean, in any detail, when you're really passionate about something, when you put it in effort, those results will show. But I promise you this insight came much later. Did anyone feel here that that statement was not appropriate, it was too strong? Did it work well for most of you? He hit on the emotional, uh, he on the uh, chairman and all those people who were listening. Because they were going to come out with a law which is going to affect the family. Yeah. This was a debate on whether they would allow same-sex marriage in Iowa. And to that, to being in Iowa, right, when you're having an argument like this, who do you want to appeal to? On the one hand, you have your side, which is already yours, unless you make a lot of mistakes and you recognize them. But it's a little more challenging to appeal to the other side. The other side is people who don't believe in same-sex marriage. What is the profile that they have? 
What does he say about islands, the state of Ireland? He says a couple of things. It's some place well, since it's the least least it is the least amended constitution of the United States. Now, typically, I've had all these wise students. One person came back and research said, actually, that's not true. It's the second least amended constitution. <laughs> so that's OK. In, in the speech, it's still OK to, to go with that if you're so close. And then what does he say? What else does he say about the state of Iowa? He says, uh, yeah, yes. Why? Yes, we are Iowans. We take care of our own problems. Now look, there's so much that's transpired in the speech. You can kind of went with people. If you really analyze it, right? there's so many dimensions. And I feel I'm bringing this from a public speaking perspective. But in your own fields, if you take just one matter and you really dissect it, and you bring out a certain level of interaction and intellectual stimulation, a little bit it'll cause putting a few people on the spot at times. But I think if they over time they'll grow to understand it. Right? It keeps it keeps you engaged too. And it also implies focus. One of the, the unthought of side kind of strategies required for this kind of instruction is less is more. If you try to get through a lot of portion in the same time and try and engage people on specifics, you're not going to be. So pick a few things. Classroom does not necessarily have to be an overview of everything. Knowledge is available now on the internet. It's to spark curiosity. We when we went to college, we had to go to libraries to actually, as you know, you know, to actually get books. There was a purpose of a library. Information is available universally and easily. What you do by the students in this environment, you engage them, you engage yourself. And take less. Less is more in a speech, less is more in teaching. And then develop this kind of q and a. I'm again rushing through this. You know, this discussion of Zach Walls takes a really nice turn that there's and we could go on for hours with my advice on this. Now, in terms of time, I think I want to switch over a little bit. What I want to do, will you be there for part of the second session? No, be there. Okay. So we might go, I don't want to keep you too hungry, but we might go a, little, a few minutes over one. Is that okay? And we do it fine. If you need to, in the middle, if you need a bathroom break and all, just, just do it. Okay. So let me do okay. One is, there is a video on a Harvard Business School case study method. There's two videos we got. One is a longer one, and then there's a slightly shorter one. I want to play that for you. And then I actually want to simulate a real case study from the perspective partly of public speaking. And so we will engage on that. That'll take about 35, 40 minutes. No, that's, that's okay. Outside of this, at the end, I will also leave you with if you are engaged in this topic, you will be what Zach Waltz. Kiran Bedi is a great case study that we can look at for a TED talk. There's actually seven or eight really good case studies of speeches that you can do on your own time. And I'll leave you with that. You have to be engaged through the process. And if your thought has not got a hearing at that point, you immediately adapt, you listen to what everyone's saying and go in the direction that the case is going. The same case done 10 times might go in 10 different directions. This is a school, it's a, you know, there's a, I actually, I live in the building right next to here, right across, and this is the whole Harvard Business School campus. Harvard University here has 13 different schools, so the dental school and the medical school. Interestingly, is actually in Boston, which is somewhere around here, but the other 10, 11 schools are all in the same area. There's a Charles River that goes around here. And this is the case study method, right? Like you're seeing, it's a little more of a beehive classroom. And interestingly, everyone has late tags. This is something you might want to think about. It's really over time you get to know the names of your students. But that name tag by itself is a very interesting dynamic in the class. The student knows they, you know who they are. If you're reaching out to them, you can immediately call them by name. And then it also makes it easier when you go back to your office, if there is class participation, to associate it with the student. This is like 75 to 90 minutes. You sit around here. The instructor will sit here. There's actually six boards. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and you can go up and down with them. That's the structure of it. 
And then the instructor will actually walk through here and they, they know it's supposed to be more of a performance than a teaching. You actually energize, you try to engage the audience through your own style. A classroom like this, you can you can use the space. Try to break that barrier of space between you and the audience. And then what happens is this seems to really work. The, the, you know, despite people having high expectations of environment like this, where you put a lot of money and you already come in expecting a lot. But for most classrooms, at the end of the class itself, there's almost a spontaneous applause. There's a feeling, wow, this is, this is fun. We go over to the world. This is a picture I was in when I did my courses. Uh, uh, that's a instructor. It's our last day of our class. And one of the still number one. One's a finance class. The other one's a non profit Regardless of the, the area, that case method can be still Okay, so let's actually play this video. So to shorten it, it's perspective from the case of the world. has this sort of bustling, sort of crackling, quiet energy, and everyone's wondering who's going to get the cold call today. Every single day, you know, it, it might happen, it might come. You can make a mistake, or you don't have to have the right answer. Whatever you say, the section is going to support you. And yet, the moment when the professor calls your name for that cold call, it's kind of unlike any other jolt. A professor will walk in the classroom and... Ask a student to start the discussion on a particular point of view. What would you do if you were the protagonist of the case? Now, what are managers responsible? <coughs> the one interesting thing about the, the case study method is that the student, before the class starts, they have to prepare all details because they don't know what they're going to be asked. So they meet in teams before, they take on the role of the protagonist, they have that discussion with all kinds of anticipation. But interestingly, as you will see here, the faculty also meet and prepare for a specific case. So that across the eight different sections in the first year at the business school, they all get the same case on the same day, but maybe at different times. So two faculty will be, one faculty will teach two, two sections. So you have, before that, you're preparing on what kind of questions you would mind ask. So eight of you get together and anticipate the whole set of questions because there isn't a right answer. Things to the societies in which they do business. But why don't you get us started? How did you vote? I voted for humanitarian. So I thought about it in the three lines framework of ethical, legal, and economic. The arguments in favor of him being humanitarian came out to be stronger. They didn't afford to see their margins go down from 47% to something like 20 to 30% and still be able to offer these drugs at slightly lower prices. What we try to do with the case method is bring as much of reality into the classroom as we can. So the cases are 15 to 20 pages long. They typically describe a Sometimes you can choose a certain course of action. I chose this treatment pattern. You know, then to argue to be able to give a rationale. See, when Gokul, I said 800 words, right? The next question that you should think about is, why did you pick that answer? There has to be some rationale in his mind. Someone else said four to 500 words. 
Now, if you just let them guess, that's one thing. But they say, wait, why did you come at 45 minutes? They say, evidence. Yeah, substance. So you make people think on the spot. Right? When you think on the spot, that sharpens your problem solving skills. In, you know, even within business schools, there's a range of using case studies 30 to 40 percent of the time to using case studies 100 percent of the time. I feel in science, in that range can probably go up to 20, 30, 40 percent of the time. It probably will not. It doesn't make sense pedagogically given the costs and benefits to this 100 percent of the time. So this is an illustration. <coughs> but it's an illustration from a field about how teaching can be at a different level of engagement. Teaching and learning. <coughs> Any other questions on, on any of the content? I think the moment you brought up said that the conference is that normal time for a lecture should be 40 minutes, so it's been about 40 minutes. Is that really true? Or the, 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 the understanding of the community of the audience is, or you lose the audience after 40 minutes? Is that really true? Now, at the undergraduate level, from what I've seen in the US institutions, there is typically an average class of 55 minutes an hour. At graduate school level, it's a lot, but it's longer, but fewer in, in days of week. That's perhaps a function of how the faculty are busy, to some extent how coursework and, and other responsibilities that you have. At the Fletcher School, our classes are 75 minutes. At the, at the Harvard Business School, they're 80 minutes. At the Kennedy School, they are 90 minutes. At the Harvard Graduate School of Education, they are three hours once a week, always on twice a week, all the hours, only twice a week. Three hours once a week, broken down with a five, ten minute break in the middle. So there is a sense that when you get to the graduate level, your attention span should be broader in a narrower field than you think. And it's also the onus of the faculty to motivate you. If you go anything, anything above like an hour and 10, 15 minutes, and even if you have an hour and 40 minutes, I would suggest breaking it up and people just to get restless and want to move up. Every lecture of yours can be that compelling. So having that break allows that, you know, it's a psychological level. So that's a good question. So what is the typical class time here? And how many, uh, how many times a week for each course? For us, it's one and a half hours. For us, it's one and a half hours, hospitality. But how many days a week? Twice or twice. It depends on... Two to three times. And say more. But as a, a teacher of one subject, how many times are you instructed? Three times. Three times. So that can be also thought depending on, and that can be thought as twice a week but a little longer. If you work with it, it's definitely possible, even in the UK and all that, that's, that is a standard, and it's about 80 minutes or so per class time. You want to break it up if you have audio, visual, and all as much as you can to make it interactive. There's also a best practice on exercises. So when you ask a question, you can break up groups of four to discuss what might be the right answer and then come back. You can get people on on stage and then they can give their response if it's a good response that needs you know. So I think that individualization, customization you have to do. But you know, when we are setting up a syllabus. We think about all these exercises in advance. So there's a little bit of planning and going back and forth on what are best practices that we What is the usual uh, strength of class for class So mine has to be capped at around 30 because each student will have to make three graded speeches and two or three other speeches. So if you just count the actual minutes that students will be speaking and while others are listening, you, I need extra time anyways, and then you don't want to bore the other students. I mean, speaking once out of 30 people is already, you know, it's a long way, so if you have more than that, that's what. At the Harvard Business School, those rooms were designed to fit about 90 students. They actually can fit 100 with guests. Uh, so there it works with 90 students, which is definitely on the higher side. At Fletcher School, the average class size is about 16 to 20. At the Harvard Kennedy School, the class size is about 40 to 50. It depends on the other entire class. So that ranges. You have a set of different classrooms for different courses. Certain courses require more intimate uh, discussion, more small group discussion. Other, the popular ones, they try and make it lecture. 
What's really interesting is the uh, system is many schools have what is called the bidding system. So typically in the uh, in US, when you get to a quality institution, say within the Harvard Kennedy School, you want to actually, people bid for professors rather than subjects. So even if they're not in to make negotiation, if there's a great professor, or it could be public infrastructure finance, they generally go for the professors. And so what happens is when you have a class of you know, 1,500 students, or for total two years, 1,500 students, class size on average of 40, 50, you can imagine that the, in, you know, the popular professors will have 600 people wanting to take them. And then the less popular professor will not also fit, fill in a class of 50, or 30, or 40. Right? So what the bidding system does is you get 1,000 points, and then you bid on them. So if in a semester you can take four courses, Max, you can bid 997 on one course and one point on the other three courses. So the good professors will go for 997. And trust me, this is motivates the professors to they otherwise without a system like this, I mean, they almost they know their price. Right? <laughs> you say there's a 900 professor or there's a professor that will be close, uh, one point professor. I mean, that, that comes with it. So with that dynamic, and then there's very little feedback. So across different dimensions at the end of the course, you take feedback very seriously. In fact, it's the number one criteria for judging a faculty performance. Not what your supervisor thinks of you, what your students think. So you get both numbers, and then you get comments. And the comments can be very detailed. I had someone wrote a two and a half page type of thing. Uh, because he had a lot of free time. You know, this is when he wrote all the details. And these things are helpful. So bidding system is something to think about, and it pushes you to kind of teach your course at the best level. You put some of their bonuses and sessions, tenure decisions, are also paid on sometimes on the bidding system. Yeah? You can continue from that. We've crafted the cases so you don't have complete information. So you have to learn how to advocate and learn how to make decisions in the presence of incomplete information. And it gives students ideally enough information so that they can put themselves in the shoes of the protagonist. And they've got to think about the people they're working with, the technology, the industry, the competition, the overall economic environment. The classroom is really sort of a culmination of uh, a learning experience that actually starts from the moment that the students actually pick up their case assignment. So my case preparation is generally a two-stage process. Um, to start, it's a, a solitary exercise. I read the case on my own. Um, I'm trying to take in as much information as I can. We're reading cases you know, from the med world, from the tech world, from the education world things that you haven't necessarily done. And most students go through a period of thinking, I must be the admissions mistake. Because look at all of these people that I'm around. I think I've learned a lot from my classmates, from their different backgrounds, the way that they see the world, their point of view is shaped by their entire background and where they came from. And you learn to see that there are a lot of different ways of looking at the same issue. Students are in learning teams or study groups where they share their ideas. It's almost like a mini case study experience in that discussion group because we will challenge each other and we're very free about it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, but it, but it was just, it was interesting, like, there's important We count on the diversity. Uh, it's one of the things that we know even from research is that the more diversity you have, the better problem solving you have. Uh, and that's what we see in a case discussion is you have better problem solving because of all the different kinds of people that we have in the class. Every professor not only knows your name, but they know where you went to college, where you're from. Throughout the class, they're very much interested in your personal professional development. Before every class, we have a meeting, and the professors discuss their ideas and their strategies for how that case might be taught. We're missing an opportunity to introduce what's really going on. spend some time talking about the substance of the case and sometimes talking about the best questions to ask.
But then what you do is you then have to get ready to be really flexible and then to give up the plan. So you, you know this is coming next. So like, where, where's the line? <laughs> right, right? I mean, there's, you know, too much. I mean, how would you even think about this? You know, it's, it's, it's all well and good to say, oh, uh, governments, NGOs, whoever should be on top of it and alert the public when the market's failing when you have uh, a situation where you have a tragedy that comes. If you can just imagine what it's like to sit in a room with 90 other people who are all there committed to talk about a given subject, a given case. Right, right. Megumi, is that how it works uh, in your experience with respect to malaria drugs and things like that? One thought that came to my mind as Victoria was speaking is this issue of will the company be the one that takes responsibility and bears some of that cost? So someone might say something particularly out of the box or off the wall. Um, you see all the hands in the classroom shoot up and really the twinkle in the professor's eye at that moment. To what extent do I just have an obligation to take opportunities to make a change versus actually creating opportunities and going out of my way? In a good class, there is some amount of tension because, let's face it, these cases and the decisions the protagonist uh, is having to make uh, are tense, and they're trade-offs, and they're tough. In some sense, I think of the classroom as a marketplace for ideas. You have 90 really smart students in, in a classroom debating their philosophies of leadership. We do things differently here at Harvard Business School. It's not the professor disseminating knowledge to the students. It's everyone participating in the co-creation of knowledge. It's definitely like a team environment, and you sort of rely on the class to bring out the best discussion in everyone. I think that the sense that we're all sort of responsible for each other's learning is something that just adds even further to this classroom experience. I want them to think, boy, I walked into class thinking I knew exactly what I'd do, and I left thinking, I'm not sure. They don't need to have all the answers. They don't need to be Superman or woman. It's okay to ask a question. It's okay to say, I don't know. That's a good thing. Business education is not about finding the right answers. It's about knowing what questions to ask. And if we can facilitate a classroom environment where students learn how to ask the right questions, that's where we want to be. It's intense, it's compassionate, it's energetic. It's a place where students learn by advocating their positions. I think the job is really not done unless students are so enthused and so energized by what happens inside that classroom that they can't stop talking about it after the class is over. You know it's a good class when we're all sharing the same breath, when everyone is leaning forward, when they, there is an emotional roller coaster, there is a narrative arc, and by the end, we just we feel like there's a crescendo. Because that's what transformational learning is all about. It's not a transaction that happens in the classroom. It's changing the way you look at the world. Thank you very much. So reactions. This film is illustrated visuals, which we were talking about. Reactions, criticisms, thoughts. Well, as he said at the end, it's not even about the answers, mm -hmm. right, as it is It's about questions. So it is not about the answers, but it is about finding a way to reach the answers. Asking the right questions, basically, right? And that's one thing that students can do. 
Absolutely. That's something that students, every student has the capability of doing. Anyone who's got into a medical dental school here, or you know, any of these engineering schools must be they're smart students, they have it, and they're, they're waiting to do this. It's for years, you know, I mean, I feel like, I don't like to criticize, but I, I spent a couple of years, you know, I, I wanted so much more, and I don't know where the basis went. It's not about blame, but it's about taking collective action, right? In the Kennedy School, we have uh, John F. Kennedy's famous slogan, he said, ask not what the country or the institution can do for you, ask what you can do for me. And I think we're also empowered now, we have access, we have access to these videos, you know, we have I mean, wherever the best practices are, we can bring in. And what can we do slowly? Just like as I talked about public speaking, that public speakers will not transform overnight. They go slowly to enjoying a big part, a slightly bigger portion of the speech. As teachers, you don't have to bring all of this in today. But at least one thing that you can change the next time. One more spark, one more engagement with the students. It's a long term, it's a marathon, right? Not as good. Even to students, I say, after you put 10 hours a week for 30 weeks, 130 hours, you do this. If you rate yourself on a scale of 0 to 10 on your public speaking, I promise you between 1 and 2 points. I'm not going to say you're going to double. And you're not going to go from 4 to 8. If you did, that's great. But even 1 point in 13 weeks is an achievement. So that's a thinking here. Anything else in terms of the sound bites from this? Uh, from the sound bites, what I heard of course that this discussion which was being happening among the students when they were sitting and when they were discussing amongst themselves, that is something very good. Because everyone will contribute in their own different way what they are thinking about that. Uh, not only about the whole case, but the part of the case they are discussing. So that, that's a very healthy kind of interaction. And lots will come out of it. You know what's also interesting is outside that the next level of dynamics is that in a classroom of this size, we typically have one chance to speak. Now, if, if you come a second time, it better be something very important. And if you've not spoken in 90 minutes, there's a chance that you will get cold called on. Typically, about 20 to 30 students will speak in a 90 minute session. So, we may give it as they are there out of 90 students. So, your chance is one third. But it invokes, so in a sense, if you say a lot, then you have to reserve yourself to say, stay, speak a couple of times. And you know, pretty much a lot of students have perspectives on anything. You know? And if you've not spoken, then you have to make sure that you push yourself again and again and again. Can I contribute now? Can I contribute? A lot of Indian students go through this a lot too. They say, well, I'm just not used to do it. I just came from IIT and I work here and I'm now suddenly now in this school. 50% of my grade is going to be what and how I say, even in this dynamic, right? If you've not spoken right till now, think about like every passing minute, think about what else you can engage on. How can you contribute? Sometimes one line is enough. Someone said something, you ask a question to someone else. That's enough. It's about quality, not quality. If you're used to speaking a lot, how can you, how can you also do that? The question here is that we are preparing the students to go out in the world and face the world. One of the most important things is communication, dialogue, how you speak. In these sort of dialogues, what happens the introverts who are there, they get a chance to speak and when they speak, they get confidence. So yeah. that I think is a very important thing in developing a personality of your student. This is what you say about employability, right, of graduates. So one, the leadership, communication, confidence, that needs a second level of training. But this is the best way to train. This is why this method over 100 plus years has been worked beside. They made a very conscious choice to say, we'll go exclusively with it. Most of the school said, well, finance, you can't teach it in case study. There's formulas. We need to understand accounting different ways. No, we will find a way where accounting in a profit and loss statement comes out from the perspective of an entrepreneur who is starting his business or business. And then let's discuss. But yes, there's tremendous benefits. Leadership, communication, teamwork, listening, in this kind of way. Let's do a last a case study before we break off on that. And I'm going to, again, you could argue in communication it's hard to do a case study. And then you push to see what can you make of your case. Here's the scenario. 
Pardon me for taking US cases, that's where I teach, but I'll, put, I'll give you another US setting, but it can apply anywhere. 1985. In 1985, you might, many of you will remember, in the US there was a space shuttle challenge. That was launched. It was a highly publicized event. The space shuttle went up, there were seven astronauts on board. One of them was a teacher. School children were actually watching this from around the nation. It was a, it was a fully televised event and President Ronald Reagan was supposed to address the entire nation in what is called a State of the Union address a, a few hours after this shuttle goes up. Now, the shuttle goes up and within a couple of minutes, there is an explosion on national TV, which we've been watching, all the astronauts, all the astronauts are here. This is really happening. Now, the script for the State of the Union address, everything's going well, our space exploration program is doing well, we've launched people, you know, put in this challenger, here's the economy. Completely, that script goes out the door. In an hour and 20 minutes, the President of the United States at that time has to address the nation. So, he will come to a group like this, and, you know, a smaller group, but I mean, let's imagine each of you are part of the President's speech writing and strategy. What will you say in this situation? Let's break it down. So I'll take on the role, I'll, I'll be ready for right now. And I'm looking for advice. So I'll try and put this down. Okay, this has happened. Now let's talk about some goals. What do I want to achieve through this speech at a very high level? And let's do this just so that, as we do in case, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand so that we can engage you versus speak. Otherwise, I don't. What are our high level goals? Next, please say right. and please say right. Accepting responsibility. Okay. Accepting responsibility. There is some that you put this on the board. Accepting. Nick, sorry. Ashmita. 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 Showing empathy towards. Okay. Okay, this is important, right? <coughs> One of the goals is honoring the departed. As a president, that is my, my goal. I need to make sure that I correctly honor the departed give respect to them. What else? Well, you said something here around accepting responsibility. That, that I will come back to. Make me say that? Making necessary amendments Name so that we can pursue the goal further. We do ourselves. So, sorry, repeat it one more time. To make necessary changes. Okay, now and is that, is that an internal goal or is that a communication goal? In terms of and to communicate, that will take further the whatever the okay. Target. So this is remember where the communication involves different constituents and different apps. There is definitely some damage control and learning from this we need to do. But on television, you are going out to the entire country. I was I was I would think a little more about acknowledging the details of what went wrong in that address. What else? But, Yes. To assure to the public why it has gone wrong. Find out why it has gone wrong. Find out the reason okay. why. Okay. So to assure, good. Okay. This so good. So what I've heard, I'll make it into two broad categories. One is honoring the department. Two is providing assurance and confidence to the people of the United States and the world. How do we feel about that? Roughly makes sense. I mean, if you would say something. Like that. that roughly makes sense. Yes. Okay. Let's see these as two broad goals, and then let's see what now. How we need to structure the speech. Remember, we're doing this real time. So sometimes you make decisions. This is probably as much time as he had for you before whatever hundred million people will be watching, or this will be recorded till now. Hope I said. Okay. Now, let's talk about who are the constituents. Is there a segmentation, if you will, in terms of our audience? <coughs> and can, within the speech, if I have these two goals, at times, I want to feel like I, I personally reach out to a specific group. So what are the different groups I need to speak to? So, you said there is one teacher. Uh, I have those as for it. And a lot of children are looking for that. Yeah. So 
you would like to talk in a language which children understand very well. So one is language. Now language may not be necessarily, it won't be a language that children, but I can directly address the children for one portion. So that is one group, a distinct group where I can have some content of my speech addressed to the children. That is what, what are other groups, if you will, segments that I can focus on. The families of the departed, they, even though that's only seven, seven people that were, but there needs to be a, a portion of my four minute speech that will directly address that family. Again, it will convey to the to the entire nation, you know, the feelings, but there's a portion that needs to go for that. Who else is, is in the other group? Sorry. The scientists, okay. Great. NASA. The entire space exploration program. It's a huge investment. Be part of US culture at that point. NASA, and then what is the corollary of that, of NASA? National of the US space exploration. Who else is watching this at that time? Who else is really watching this TV in 1985? USSR, right? Messaging for how will my my conveying a portion of my speech to NASA will impact the USSR? And there was a space race in that. Anyone else? Any other specific consequences? <coughs> this is a good enough. Again, at some point you see where the discussion goes. We've done a good good enough exhaustion. Let's move forward. Now, as well as the president going into the speech, I have some specific questions. With regards to the astronauts that have lost their lives, and this trade-off between bringing up a frame that is negative or causes anxiety, sadness, versus being direct, should I name the actual astronauts that lost their lives? I should name them at the risk of bringing this memory up in people's mind more vividly. I'm just thinking, and it's not a leading question, I'm asking, should I name the astronauts? How many of you feel I should not name the astronauts in the public, in this address? Yes, Asmita, so. so that will touch the, the emotional side of people, uh, his family members might not Okay. I would not want to hear somebody from my family who died, his name to be announced that he is no more. I mean, I mean, I mean, the case study is, is the one. So, yes. so hold on. The thing, the thing is, who, who feels, who supports this argument or believes there's some merit to it? One voice here, okay. Who strongly feels that we should name the astronauts? Okay, please, Dr. White. Mayura. Sorry? Mayura. Right. Also, one more thing, Dr. We said, students, when you are speaking in class, okay, imagine that you are on national TV, and there actually is a camera here. Okay. <laughs> and the other thing is that every person in this class should be able to hear you. So if, if you are have a soft voice, it is pushing you a little bit more, then let's, let's make so. With that thought, um, and no pressure. I think the name should be definitely mentioned because I consider it as a sacrifice for the country, for the whole fact of science. So I think you should definitely mention. Did you hear? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> because it is, what was the second part of your question? Of your answer? I think it's a second sacrifice for the sake of the country and for science. Okay, great. Okay, the word sacrifice. Lovely. Sometimes you need anchor words too. Sacrifice. Good. That's actually got me thinking of another word, which is pioneers. We could argue in our speech that these were pioneers who gave their lives to the forwarding of science. So this is how it happened. You'll say something in speech, you were a speech writing. It gives you an image. Okay. And since the majority of you feel that I should name individually, a, it shows we acknowledge every person that loses their lives. We are not afraid of mentioning this directly on TV. And then, you know, we're, we're, we're straight, we're a very direct nation. And we will learn from this and position it as a sacrifice or as pioneers. Now, when we talk to in television, right, you think about the lower common denominators. You have to reach out to a larger group. 
and you want to make things a little more simple. If we can have an analogy, that will work well. So what are some analogies in history that we might think of for pioneers that when something like this might have happened? Soldiers. Yeah, you could have in India also, you could have Soldiers. Okay. Soldiers. Great. Heroes. Soldiers who go out and serve the nation. Who else is even more similar? Martyrs. Okay, here. At that time, you know, if you look at history, more oh, Western history, a lot of sailors, so, you know, Christopher Columbus. Columbus then has some connotations with the Native Americans there. Sir Francis Drake, which also again has some connotations, but he was someone who had sailed and then lost his life in the sea. So he lived by the sea and died by the sea in, in the quest for exploration. Now, in terms of an overall tour, when we talked about two conflicting things, one seemingly in terms of emotion, already the departed giving assurance. What kind of a, a tone and expression is appropriate? And this I'm not asking as Reagan would ask because you have this one. How how do you think about your somber lower song? So you have to be inspired through a somber tone, which is so different. You have two very conflicting areas. Probably you could start with a somber note and then go for change or what is not teaching or what to And it again depends on the on what you're speaking of, right? So what we will do is now we'll play the four minutes. This is gone down as one of the the, the best, the most challenging, best speeches ever. It's not best in terms of completely you know exciting you, but just see both the, the logos, right? the pathos. And then it's a 1985 recording, so uh, yeah. Clinton was going against, well, not going against, but she was having a debate with Barack Obama before the Democrat nomination was decided in the US. This is in 2008. They were in different locations, and they weren't, they can't really debate because they're part of the same party, but they had to, I mean, still in each state there was going to be an election of who the Democratic nominee was there. Again, we think of speeches, we think of four minutes prepared and delivering. There's a whole other impromptu, on the spot aspect to it. So, Hillary was in a stage, she was just an audience like this, she was on a stage, Obama or somewhere else. And then the camera from ABC the anchor goes to Hillary and asks her this question. Hillary, what do you have to say to the voters of New Hampshire, the state where they were there, who appreciate your experience? already been in the White House, to appreciate your experience, but seem to like Barack Obama more. <coughs> take 15 seconds or so to think about what you would say. And then I'm going to simulate it and come to one of you. Okay. <coughs> 15 seconds, take happy you must say. You might be better. But please think about this too, okay? seconds. <coughs> Think about what you will say on national TV. Put yourself in a position. <coughs> we will come back from commercial break right now. Studio ready. Light check good. Sound check good. Hyper ready. Go. Go in five and three. Two, one, Q, and go. Good evening and welcome back. Watching Hard Talk, we'll go back to Hillary Clinton. Hillary, what do you have to say to the voters of New Hampshire who seem to appreciate your experience but also seem to like Barack Obama more? My. <laughs> I would be acknowledging that they will like me uh, as a person in the house. Okay, we're going to cut, go back to studio, where we do it. Now, it, it, it is a, like your, just your response, and don't worry, just speak. So it's not what you would say, you're actually on camera. Okay, we do it. Three, two, one, Q. What do you have to say to the voters in New Hampshire who seem to appreciate your experience but seem to still like Obama more? Maybe he's uh, more competent. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a tough. Uh, yeah. It's okay. You know, sometimes. Okay. Let's take one. Okay. 
you, but I think you were trying to get at, you were trying to uh, give him, you were not trying to fight against him, you were trying to acknowledge something positive about him, which is a good effort. What do you think about voters from New Hampshire who seem to like Barack Obama more? Uh, at the end of the day, it's the nation that matters. So I have the experience, he has the courage. If the nation benefits, I don't. It's, it's for the people. No. Okay. But this is tough. This is on the spot, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to do this three times, the third time, fourth time, you, you know, it'll be a little better and better. But like sometimes in life, you only have one opportunity. What do you have to say to the voters of New Hampshire, one more time, who seem to like Barack Obama more Hillary? I would say listen to your heart, but act by your head. <laughs> <laughs> What a beautiful response. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, one more. We take a volunteer. Yes? You're <laughs> 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 very creative answers. <laughs> okay. Uh, one last one. Okay. What do you have to say to the voters of New Hampshire who seem to like Barack Obama more? I will ask my own mother then. <laughs> what will you say? Well, you like him more, but give me a chance to, to prove to you. Uh, That's a good experience. 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 There's a lot, there's dual, uh, you want to say something about yourself, someone's giving you this frame, now, which survey, who survey, we don't know, someone is giving you a bit. Remember when you're on camera, press conferences, which you face a lot, you want to give the answer that you want to give and not what the reporter is, is coming right? The question is up to the reporter, the answer is up to you. You can choose to go to that frame or not. Now, Hillary Clinton has already been eight years in the White House, she's already done so much in her life, she's older than Obama by a decade or so. She doesn't even know we need to go to this frame, but I've done this, that. That's the first choice. When people are put on the spot, they go to that, but I've, you know, but I've done this, I've done that. What did she say which shows maturity of public speaking? What did she actually say? It's beautiful. It shows the human element. When this was asked, Hillary took a couple of seconds, right? And that sh and she said, you know what, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> the audience is like that, a few smiles, you think, oh, okay, wait, we'll go to. Then she took a couple more seconds, and then she smiled, and her daughter was there, Chelsea, and she said, but you know what, he's a really likable man. He's, he's a really likable man. Again, more smiles, you know, it's the audience. If you're doing it in real time, you feel it. Oh, you know, this is a difference. Two seconds later, she again thought about it, and she smiled and said, but you know, I'm not that bad. I don't think I'm that bad myself. She just kind of smiled. She will be Now, this is against conventional wisdom of, or strategy of, you know, list your things here, or give a wise answer, or give a, I mean, your answer was quite good. I really liked it, you know, but still, this took away this whole kind of let me say something against him. Just give a very human response. So those are sometimes the best. Now, she's given these three responses. The camera goes to Barack Obama. The red light is on. <laughs> now, the anchor doesn't necessarily ask anything, but Obama knows that uh, he's on camera. What would you say to Obama? <laughs> no, Hillary's just said these three okay. things. Camera's on you. Like, fifteen seconds. For Obama. I would say I love you, Barack. No, we are a team. I think this is a, I mean, a brilliant response. So, for the sake of time, Hillary said the last thing she said. 
I don't think I'm that bad myself. Camera goes to Obama. What do you say if you are Obama? <laughs> Okay. Any volunteers for this? What did you say if you're wrong? Can you say what should you say? I'm not bad either. I'm not that bad, but that's already been said, right? It's been said in the survey then. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Hillary. Now, even Obama, who's a great orator, do you know what he actually said in real time? This all happened in Sunday. Hillary said these things, camera goes on him, and he said, Oh, you're, not, you're, you're likable enough, Hillary. You're likable enough, Hillary. Not what he meant to say, but came across as condescending. So papers carried that next day. Hillary scored an upset victory in this. She was not high on the board. I don't know if you can argue if it's only related to this, but she did win an you know, upset round here. So again, the spoken word has so many dimensions, right? Like it's, it's an art, like any subject, it needs its time. For students who get the five most commonly asked interview questions, you know, which is why us, why you, tell me your strengths and weaknesses, give me an example of time when, and what questions do you have for me. These are five standard questions you get in most, at least in business interviews. I asked them if I was to ask you, what are your top three strengths or weaknesses? The first time you would say that, you would say, uh, oh, um, well, let's see, uh, I, I, good with people, I like data, you know, I can work with data, and you know, lead, like maybe, yeah, leadership. Then I'll go to someone else, come back, you say, what are your top three strengths? Second time, you say, okay, like I said, you know, I think I'm a good leader. Uh, I, I feel I can work well with people, and when it comes to data management, that's a strength. I'll go to someone else, third time I'll come to you, and then you'll say, okay, leadership, data management, teamwork, example one, example two. So why make you interview your, your trial? Why make a public speaking scenario? Your trial? I think presence of mind comes a lot. Well, and practice. And, practice. and sometimes being you in, in this case, being natural, that happens when you're relaxed. Not if you're like that intense player, you know, I'm not saying such intense looker is like that. He probably is much more on the relaxed side. <coughs> intense player. I, I have to do this well. They've asked me this question and I have to answer it the best as possible. What can I say? Versus, you know, let me enjoy this process. Someone said, you're not as likable as Obama. But if you were relaxed and talk, what would you think? That would hurt your feelings, right? And you can say it in a fun way. Right? That's making people like you. You know what? appreciate who you are. This is a very natural process and thinking of public speaking, thinking of learning as natural as possible. If we have that yeah. streaming, let's end with, uh, just see how, how this is conveyed. A uh, few minutes of freedom speech. I plan to speak to you tonight to report on the State of the Union. The events of earlier today have led me to change those plans. Today is a day for mourning and remembrance. Nancy and I are pain to the core of the tragedy of the shuttle challenge. We know we share this pain with all the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. Nineteen years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But we've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. And perhaps we've forgotten the courage it took for the crew of the shuttle. But they, the Challenger 7, were aware of the dangers, overcame them, did their job brilliantly. We mourn seven heroes, Michael Smith, Dick Scobie, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis, and Christian McGough. We mourn their loss as a nation together. The families of the seven, we cannot bear as you do the full impact of this tragedy. But we feel the loss, and we're thinking about you so very much. Your loved ones were daring and brave, and they had that special grace, that special spirit that says, give me a challenge, and I'll meet it with joy. They had a hunger to explore the universe and discover its truths. They wished to serve, and they did. They served all of us. We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States space program has been doing just that. 
We've grown used to the idea of space, and perhaps we forget that we've only just begun. We're still pioneers. They, members of the Challenger crew, were pioneers. And I want to say something to the school children of America who are watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of a process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew is pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow. I've always had great faith in and respect for our space program, and what happened today does nothing to diminish it. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. That's the way freedom is, and we wouldn't change it for a minute. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. I want to add that I wish I could talk to every man and woman who works for NASA or who worked on this mission and tell them your dedication and professionalism have moved and impressed us for decades. And we know of your anguish. We share it. There's a coincidence today. On this day, 390 years ago, the great explorer Sir Francis Drake died aboard ship off the coast of Panama. In his lifetime, the great frontiers were the oceans, and the historian later said he lived by the sea, died on it, and was buried in it. But today, we can say the Challenger crew, their dedication was, like Drake's, complete. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. Four minutes. Just a couple of minutes of reflection for this. Sound bites that stood out to you. The future is not for the faint-hearted. It is for the brave. What else in terms of the sound? The space program will continue. He actually says in the middle to the children who are watching this, accidents like this happen. This is a part of life and part of all of us. You could also see the president, I mean, they're just so authentic. You know, yes, he was an actor, but this is not something he can act with. It was coming, you could see the, the camera was like zooming in closer and closer because there was such, you know, you're lost in performance. You say with a sport or with something that you, that is so genuine and sync with what you are. You lose concept of time, you're just lost in that performance. Zach Walls in his third minute was losing himself, you know, when he reached that percent of naturally. And you could go closer and closer on his face and you could see so much. At the end, he has an analogy. You know? It is somehow to that presence of mind as a coincidence 390 years ago today. Sir Francis Drake died. He lived by the sea, died by the sea. And his sacrifice was like the members of the space shuttle challenger complete. Remember, this has all been scripted in an hour and 20 minutes. Obviously, he didn't expect me to do that this way. But all this is put together in an hour, 20 minutes before he goes on writing. So anyways, I'll, I'll keep time and I'll just say, I'll just leave you with thought that the, you know, the, the spoken word is powerful in any field. Give it its respect. I feel that it needs some time. Uh, and then it will make a change in your own lives and uh, you know, also in the lives of people that you touch. Change for social change. Real societal change in your field. And, uh, you know, I think if we, anything that we choose to do, I mean, I don't want to give you philosophy, but I, mean, I just feel if it's uh, something that, you know, we approach with a little more, just a little more rigor and make small incremental changes every day, I think it can be more exciting and fulfilling for, for everyone.
Thank you sincerely.